good. I love, and I showed the kids that too. And they were like, that's Professor Snape, <laughs> you know? So it was fun to get him into literature like that. And even though I wasn't great at it, I usually would have to do a lot of work as I plan those units, whereas other books I knew like the back of my hand. Um, I can see people are starting to trickle in. So welcome, everybody. Feel free if you want to put your name into the chat. Make sure that when you do put your name into the chat that you are um, uh, switching the little button on the bottom because it defaults to hosts and panelists. You want to make sure you're saying hello to everybody. So hi, Steve. I see you here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and read my script, and then I'm going to turn it over to you, Stephen. So this will take about five minutes. Um, okay. So hi, everybody, and thanks so much for joining us at Secular AZ today. Again, feel free to put your name in the chat, uh, in the webinar, or on Facebook. We are a nonprofit organization focused on protecting the Constitution and the separation of church and state for over a decade, and we have great programming. Uh, we have these Friday updates from all kinds of speakers from all walks of life, historians, authors, elected officials, journalists, et cetera. Um, we will be starting, uh, because it is an election year, we will be starting our school board candidate forums. You know, school board members are the bottom of the ballot, and they don't get a lot of um, time to talk about what they're doing, but those races are really important. And as if you've been following along at all, you know that that's where Christian nationalists are really trying to take over entire school boards and dismantle our public schools from within. So stay tuned. We'll be talking about that and setting up a schedule for that as we get closer to 2024. Um, next Friday, we're going to be ending our speaker series about homelessness. Uh, and this is at a special time. So take note, it's going to be at 7 p.m. And it's with special guest Manuel Mejido Costoya. Uh, he is going to be speaking about partnering with religion to tackle homelessness beyond the culture wars. So this one sounds right up our alley. Um, and that's kind of the wrap up of the uh, series on homelessness. After that, we will have a discussion. Uh, I can't remember. Carol is the woman's name. Carol Burris, I believe, is her name. And uh, we're going to be talking about the growing danger of right wing charter schools. And then we're going to kick off a series about the ties between evangelical extremists and their absolute obsession with guns. So looking forward to all that. If there's a topic that you'd really like to discuss, I'd love to hear from you. Throw it in the chat, put it on Facebook. Let us know what topics you want to talk about as it relates to secularism, humanism, atheism, agnosticism, agnosticism, agnosticism anyway. Um, <laughs> and also we're going to be looking for volunteers to help with our school board support initiative. Um, and we also have some vacancies on our board of directors. So if you're interested in any of those things, please reach out. Uh, you can do that at info at secularaz.org. But for today, we will be talking with Stephen Matheson. He is a former president of the board of directors of the Humanist Chaplaincy at Harvard and MIT. He is a biologist, a bardolator, a beer lover, a bicyclist, and a baseball fan. Ooh, I'll have to find out what your favorite team is in just a second. Um, he works in nonprofit scientific publishing at the Public Library of Science, and he lives in Tucson, Arizona. So welcome, Stephen. Is there anything that I missed in your bio? No, except uh, the Boston Red Sox is the answer to the question you're looking for, so. I can accept that. If you had said the Yankees, I would have had to end it. Or if you had said yeah, the, no. the White Sox or the Dodgers, we would not be friends. But mm -hmm. the, the Red Sox are fine. And I was really happy when they, like the Cubs, because I'm a Cubs fan, you know, they broke that long, whatever, 96 year streak back in the early 2000s, I think. I think we even like we were set up and that's anyway, it was a whole thing. And I'm always happy to see the underdog win. So I'll, I'll accept Boston Red Sox. Um, anyway, nice. I'm going to just go ahead and turn it right over to you and you can get us started. And like I said, folks, if you do have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Take it away, Stephen. Um, cool. Thank you for having me. Um, uh, it's an honor and it's it'll be great. This will be lots of fun. So I, I do have a presentation. Um, that is mostly just to keep me on, you know, track um, that I'm happy to share after we're done. And, and everyone's welcome to contact me if you have any questions about stuff. Um, one disclaimer before I start. Uh, I, I am not actually an expert on chaplaincy. So like the word chaplain does mean something kind of specific. Um, chaplaincies at universities, which will be our main focus uh, today, since that's the one we have. Um, at Harvard and MIT, 
Um, they were, they were, I mean, they were the flavor of the month, 2018. And I think they need to go down a little bit. Um, so I'm not actually an expert on the status, like which institutions have them, which ones don't, which ones have not been sustained, all of that. Um, but with that said, this is, this is a sort of first person eyewitness account of, part of um, the chaplaincy uh, to this day um, and also all the other things that it, that it did. So I hope, hope you think it's interesting and fun. And where I'm gonna end guys is with, what if we wanted one or two or three of these in Arizona? Because we have three, three great universities. Well, I mean, am I required to say that Grand Canyon is a university? I guess I am. So we have universities in Arizona um, and, and um, all of them, the students of all of them would, would, would be better off if they had access to a, a humanist chaplain. All right, with all that said, let me, let me uh, share my screen and show you my presentation. Um, and hopefully you can see a sort of interesting pink background that's got um, my title, uh, Humanist Chaplaincy at Harvard and MIT, an overview with discussion. So uh, does that look good, uh, Jean? Jean, you can see it? Okay, good. Um, and what, you know, let's end with by talking about what could we, what could we do if we want to in Arizona? So quickly about me. So yes, so I'm coming to you from Tucson. Um, I am, uh, uh, sorry. This is, a, this is our outline. I'll introduce myself more. I'll, talk, I'll talk about what is a humanist chaplain. I'll give a little bit of history of Harvard humanist chaplaincy, which was in fact the first humanist chaplaincy in North America, if not the world. Tell you about this interesting period during the history of the chaplaincy called the Humanist Hub from 13 to 18. Um, highlights especially lessons like what should we not do wrong? This next time. Um, chaplaincies at other universities quickly and then where and how could we do this in Arizona? Okay, me. I am an Arizonan. I say kinda because so I went to Cortez High School. Uh, I was going to ask for applause, but it doesn't really work in a webinar. But if you if you know my high school up uh, there by what used to be Metro Center, um, and then uh, the University of Arizona uh, as an undergraduate, and the, and then again later as a as a graduate student. Um, the reason I say kind of favorite place we ever lived was Cambridge, Massachusetts. And we moved here in the pandemic in 2020. Um, honestly, not intending to stay, just to be close to family. I've got a couple kids who lived here, um, live here, and. Um, we wanted to live somewhere where we weren't trapped in a two bedroom apartment like we were during the pandemic in, in Cambridge. But one thing's led to another and I think we're gonna stay. In fact, we bought a house and so now we're screwed, we have to stay. Um, and I hope it didn't make it sound like I'm unhappy to be here or not, but it was an interesting choice for us because we've been away from, from Arizona for before that for 25 years. I'm a scientist, uh, a biologist in particular, um, my bachelor's from the University of Arizona in cellular and developmental biology. Um, and then uh, all the all the squishy biology stuff. What I do today, especially, is I'm a, a scientific journal editor. So I was at a journal called Cell Reports, which I hope maybe a couple of you have heard of, um, open access journal at Cell Press um, in biology for 10 years until last year when I moved to this nonprofit uh, journal publishing organization called PLOS. Uh, rhymes with floss. Um, it does stand for Public Library of Science. And again, if there are scientists in the crowd, you may have heard of, of these journals. So now, now I'm the boss of editors in chief um, of journals. So that's what I do. Uh, think about journal publishing and open access and things like that that are topics maybe for another time. I am an apostate. Um, I love I love how how uh, Christianity. You know, comes up with these classy ways to describe human beings. Uh, so I was raised Catholic, became an evangelical at the University of Arizona, then reformed, if that means anything to you. And if it doesn't, you know, you're lucky. Um, and then uh, both my, my wife and I basically simultaneously deconverted about 10 years ago. So I guess now I'm uh, godless. The reason I mention that is it's part of why we got involved in the chaplaincy at Harvard. In the first place, we lived in Cambridge, um, which is blocks away from where everything was happening. And we were like just about anyone who has left religion, any kind of religion, in need of community. Um, I think that's one of the big stories of the loss of religion in, in, 
in the States. It's, um, it's a cliche to say this, but religions uh, provide people with automatic communities. And when you leave, you, you lose that sometimes catastrophically. For us, it hasn't been catastrophic, but it's clearly a need. So anyway, that's why it's worth mentioning. All right, so what is a humanist chaplain? Yeah, so <laughs> the short, snarky, but accurate answer is a, a humanist chaplain is the same as a religious chaplain, but without the religion. And that is actually what a humanist chaplain is in some ways. It's a silly question, um, and yet it's not because if I, I think for most people, especially people my age, if we say chaplain, you picture, you probably picture a, perhaps a priest, uh, certainly picture someone who's going to come in with a little book and who's going to do religious things, um, and you might picture someone at a university. Uh, I was familiar with chaplains at university, someone in a hospital, um, or someone in the military. So what do they do? Uh, it's not hard to imagine, but so counseling is probably one of the main things that most um, chaplains do. And I'm using that term loosely. It was just so talking to people, giving them advice or helping them find help that they need. Um, uh, organizing or, or um, overseeing community. Um, so perhaps through meetings, groups, things like that um, to facilitate connection. Um, a chaplain, whether they're religious or not, is probably trained in and will be involved in ceremonies of various kinds. So, you know, chaplains, humanist chaplains uh, can, as I hope you know, uh, marry people, um, preside at um, ceremonies that are both legal and, you know, and just um, ceremonial. And then service and outreach with chaplain is, is likely going to be involved in organizing people to do community service or either to each other in their community or outside the community. Um, down at the bottom, I wrote professional training. Uh, and, you know, we're probably thinking of seminary here. Um, and by the way, seminaries uh, do train humanist chaplains. So there's no clear, there's no expectation that when we say seminary, we mean, oh, well, then they must be a religion, not necessarily, but um, there aren't there aren't hard and fast definitions of the kind of training that one must have in order to call oneself a chaplain. So if someone says they're a chaplain, they have not necessarily told you that they got an MDiv in their religion or in or in humanism from some accredited institution. Not necessarily, um, but. It, but certainly the chaplaincy at Harvard and the, the kind of leadership that the Harvard chaplaincy wants to give to other chaplaincies is like, you know, this is a professional. It's not just someone who says, yeah, hey, I'm a, I'm a pastor, so I'm a chaplain. You may know that um, some of our campuses and the, my alma mater here at the U of A, here in Tucson, um, has had some serious problems with cult um, religious organizations where that's exactly what the person did. They're like, yeah, I'm a pastor. God said I was, so that settles it. And now they're recruiting people on the campus and all that stuff. So anyway, we're not going to talk about that, but humanist chaplain. So the Harvard, the chaplaincy at Harvard is, we think, um, the first humanist chaplaincy in North America. It is certainly the first humanist chaplaincy at a university or college uh, in in North America. And the reason there's that stipulation in North America is because the, the, the idea of humanist chaplaincy really was kind of born abroad um, in the Netherlands, I think. Um, so we mustn't, Harvard, Harvard has never been shy about claiming priority for things it didn't actually do. So let's add that joke there, but um, this is the first one. And that 1974, that is a long time ago. That is long before I think, if you don't mind me saying this, long before it was respectable to be a, a secular humanist, uh, uh, an atheist, or an apostate, um, which in fact Tom Farrick was. So Tom Farrick founded uh, the Harvard Humanist Chaplaincy all those years ago. He was uh, he was a Catholic priest and a chaplain as a Catholic priest uh, before his uh, his loss of faith, his deconversion. Um, so I think that 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 event or it's never an event, right? That process of him 
uh, uh, deconverting. I'm using the word deconvert. It might mean something specific to you, and I apologize for that. But he left Christianity and he doesn't believe in, didn't believe in God. That happened a few years before. Then he says, well, hey, I'd like to be a chaplain still. Why not? Uh, and he started started at Harvard. Uh, I think that's an amazing story. It's really inspiring. I never got to meet him that few years ago. Uh, for over 30 years in that capacity. And one of the things that's maybe not emphasized enough about what it meant for him to start that chaplaincy is that um, before him in 1974, there were three chaplains at Harvard, as there were, surely, at every other educational institution in the world. And you can guess what they were, Protestants, Catholics, and Judaism. There you go. We're all done. That's all we need. There's no other religions, are there? Um, and I'm sorry for the, for being sarcastic there. But he, he became the fourth. Um, and, he, and and what that did was, I think, the, the, his, his, he's credited with deconstructing or disassembling this assumption that a chaplain meant something real specific. It meant a religion. It meant one of these religions and none of the other ones. If you look now at the chaplain page, at, at Harvard, I think it's chaplains.harvard.edu. There are at least 30 chaplains. There are, there's a Zoroastrian chaplain. There are numerous Christian chaplains, not just one, not numerous Protestants, not just one. Um, it, it, it's, it's truly a picture of religious diversity and that's because of Tom Farrick in 1974. A point of interest as we go and also of, uh, frankly, regret of over the years as he attracted a modest endowment. I, uh, the reason I say regret is the endowment was given to Harvard. Uh, it was many millions of dollars. And the person who was, who was, who was directing their, their inheritance to, to the institution set aside a little tiny part of it to be an endowment for the chaplaincy. So that's something to celebrate. It's great. It keeps us afloat. Um, but the regret is it could have been a lot more because this person was an admirer and thought it was cool. So anyway, but there, th this is a chaplaincy that's endowed, and some of the some of the annual income required to support our chaplain comes from this endowment, which is something we're obviously grateful for. So there's been only two chaplains at Harvard because Greg Epstein is the current uh, chaplain at Harvard and now MIT, as I'll explain in a second, and he took over in 2005 when Tom Barrick retired. So Greg Epstein, just a little bit about Greg Epstein. Many of you are probably familiar with his work. Perhaps you've read Good Without God. Maybe you've even met Greg. Um, he was trained at the University of Michigan um, and, then, and then at Harvard Divinity School. By the way, you can get, uh, I don't know if it's an MDiv, but you can study to be a chaplain, a humanist chaplain at Harvard Divinity. He's to this day ordained uh, as a secular rabbi, which is a Again, that's a very interesting. There is there is such a thing as a secular rabbi. I don't think you'll catch an evangelical referring to a secular pastor. Like to them, that's just, you know that makes no sense. Greg is ordained um, as rabbi, but specifically secular. He's best known for his book Good Without God in two thousand nine. And let's not we don't want to talk too much about it, except you know that book. It's it's um. It's subtitled, What a Billion Non-Believers Do Believe. I think I've got that right. Um, that book was basically the answer to um, what was called then, and is still called now, I think, The Four Horsemen, the, um, the, the four well-known atheists who were, who were writing uh, a few years before that. So Richard Dawkins with the God Delusion, <clears throat> a personal hero of mine, uh, Sam Harris, not a personal hero of mine, um, and Christopher Hitchens. So they were all sort of writing about trying to get rid of God. And so Greg's, Greg's response to that is not to say, let's have God, you know, no. But, you know, it's a positive vision of what it means to be godless without God. It's a great book. Um, uh, then right now, um, uh, starting in 2018, Greg became also the convener for Ethical Life. That's a funny title at MIT, but it's uh, they have these roles called conveners, but specifically the Harvard, the, sorry, the humanist chaplain also at MIT. So he's now got these two roles. He's the chaplain at MIT and the humanist chaplain at Harvard. Um, 
at Harvard right now, Greg's actually the president of the Council of Chaplains at Harvard. And that was in the New York Times several months ago. And yeah, I was like, wow, an atheist is the president of the chaplain. See how much atheism has taken over our great institutions. Yeah, all that, all that bullshit. Anyway, um, uh, in 2019, Greg took a sabbatical. And this is interesting because he's, he's very interested in the intersection of religion and technology. Um, he wrote at TechCrunch, which is a sort of online magazine. Actually, it might be a printed magazine too. I don't know, but writing about technology and tech, um, how it interfaces with religion. Um, and what I don't, he never really he writes about how Christians use, you know, Facebook to, you know, lie. It, it's not that. It's about technology stuff, how it's embedded in our lives. And it's very interesting stuff. His work on tech and religion is actually just published last week in the MIT Technology Review. It's called Rise of the Tech Ethics Congregation. And I recommend it. It's really interesting stuff. And it's where, where Greg's really into right now. So um, starting in 2013, Greg's work as a chaplain, a, a, a standard chaplain, so doing chaplain stuff at Harvard University, um, started to grow, I think, because Good Without God made Greg into a, a, a celebrity, um, a humanist, a sort of go-to person for comments about humanism, a go-to person who could talk about being godless, but, but without bashing religion. I just need to stop and ask you all. One of the reasons I always like, so Greg's a friend of mine, and one of the reasons I'm so attracted to him is I am not a person who is godless and who doesn't bash religion. I hate religion. I have earned the right to hate religion, but that's no way to live, right? I it just, it's it's not good. Um, it's one thing to say, that's another thing to do it, to live it. Greg is the is sort of my example for how to do that. Greg simply doesn't talk about all the shitty things evangelicals do. That's not because he doesn't know them or doesn't care, but that his he's doing something different, and it's it's pretty cool. Anyway. Humanist Pub starts in 2013. I was there the day it was founded, um, up in, in in this space in Harvard Square. Um, it was uh, Dan Dennett was was there to give the sort of I don't know what you call it the you know ribbon cutting speech, um, and it was standing room only. And in this space had an auditorium that seated at least 100 people, um, offices and classrooms uh, right in the heart of Harvard Square. At its peak, um, there would be 100 people in that room and it'd be a little too hot. Um, it, uh, there was a weekly program every Sunday um, uh, in the afternoon, because you know we don't really want to be church, so we'll have afternoon services and not morning services. But um, there were larger special programs two to three times a year. This whole thing was called the Humanist Hub. Um, it has staff, um, it had um, clerical support and um, and uh, interns, assistant chaplains. For a time, there was a, I think we just have to call it a Sunday school, um, a, a something called the Big Questions Lab that was at least partly named after and funded by E.O. Wilson, Ed Wilson, um, that would use some of the classrooms and kids came and did fun activities while the adults were at church. Uh, no other way to say it. Uh, small groups were a part of this program. My wife and I uh, led one called, and we just did it just once, but called um, uh, Recovering from Religion for people like us who had uh, were apostates and had deconverted from, from religion. Uh, community service programs, uh, the Humanist Hub was a, a designated meal packing center where people would, they would come once a month and 50 people would come and, who from all over the place and not from our community and pack meals. Uh, so there was a lot going on at the Humanist Hub for, for many years. It was really cool. It was all added on to the standard role of being a chaplain. But of course, students were welcome at all these programs and um, it's a big deal, it's really cool. Um, so well, here are some highlights of what, you know, what you could have experienced or expected or been a part of during those years. So my favorite, I already mentioned this, Dan Dennett. Um, if you don't know Dan Dennett's work, you might, a uh, philosopher, um, a really interesting, really interesting guy and a really good 
guy. Um, I got to introduce him when he came to give his talk about, he was talking about consciousness and not, not about religion specifically. I don't know if you know the work of Jordan Klepper. It's the kind of, so this guy's a, he's a, he, he's a comedian and, and producer and I don't know how to describe Jordan Klepper. If, if you, you should look up his videos that are, they give, they give uh, a lot of, well, let's just say, Cringe is 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 the word to describe what happens when you watch Jordan Klepper because this guy has the courage to go to a Trump rally in 2016, or to a MAGA rally and and just talk to people and let them hang themselves to their own rope and it's it, it's funny and hor it's horrifying just what all religion is right it's just oh my god anyway you know, you know what was so cool about Jordan Klepper I introduced him and. So I, this is where I told a little bit of my story that day as I said, you know, Jordan Klepper does what Greg does, which is he doesn't, you don't ever hear him saying what, you know, some horrible things about Christianity. One thing, he doesn't need to, he just has to give Christianity a microphone and it takes care of that for him. But the point is, a really nice guy, a really good guy. And he gave, he came to visit the human hub and he was one of the speakers. I just asked people to put up their hands if anyone if how many of you are familiar with the work of Michael Keyes, the name he goes by, he leads the Military Religious Freedom Foundation. So he was a visitor, gave a presentation, and um, it was unforgettable. First of all, his work is extremely important. This is he, this is a dude who was serving the military, who is Republican, and who realized that um, the military place where people get proselytized and um, then abused for what they do or don't believe about, you know, Jesus and his entourage. Mikey Weinstein came to talk about his work, and he was flanked by two armed police officers of the Cambridge Police Department. And by flanked, I mean, when he was introduced by, by Greg, he didn't, he didn't come up to the stage. It was a stage, a little elevated platform in front of our auditorium. He didn't come till he was introduced and he walked in with those two officers who then stood on his right and his left while he talked to us about his ministry. I hope you don't mind me calling it a ministry because that's what it is. Um, and um, I don't think I need to explain to you why he was accompanied by police officers. He doesn't live in Cambridge, but when he goes somewhere, he has to be protected. Um, so that was pretty unforgettable. <laughs> like, Jesus Christ. Um, Eo Wilson, well, famous sociobiologist, evolutionary biologist, and benefactor of our, of our hub, he spoke one day. We had to sell tickets to that and turn people away. Gee, do I need to stop for a second and take a question, or are we all good? There are no questions, more just okay. comments. Okay. There's just some comments. Yeah. OK. About my bad language, I hope I hope I'm okay. I promise not to drop any f bombs or anything. Even though, if you, in, technically, I did just now because I put it in your head, even though I didn't say it. Um, one of my favorites, Vanessa Zoltan, again a friend of mine, uh, was an assistant chaplain um, in the organization for a while, and um, was studying as a seminarian, studying um, humanist um, uh, ministry. At, uh, was the idea of a sacred text. So Vanessa's Vanessa's work to this day. She was Vanessa was interviewed on NPR just last week uh, by Rachel Martin. I think is the person who runs that show about religion. Vanessa asked this question: you know, Bible things, these sacred texts that that people read and that they center themselves on and they get inspiration from. If you're not a believer. Does it make any sense to have a sacred text? Now, she, she never meant that, oh, well, then that, that text was delivered by a deity to a mountain on tablets or any of that nonsense. But what she was doing was asking this question about how people live, about what about the idea of taking a text, a book, uh, it could be anything, and just saying, I'm going to come to this text and ask it to speak to me. I'm going to come to this text expecting 
to learn from it. I'm going to come humbly to it. I'm not going to come as a critic. I'm going to come as a, I don't know, as a, a devotee. I don't know. Vanessa's text that she was most interested in, and that was her personal sort of um, sacred text, was actually Jane Eyre. And she talked about Jane Eyre, and she gave a presentation about that Jane Eyre as a sacred text. But this is a it's not a perfect book, right? In fact, it's a real problematic in certain area aspects, but come to it and ask it to speak. And then, then she ran a whole program on the Harry Potter books, Harry Potter as a sacred text, where people come and they would have read part of it, uh, you know, a, a, a particular chapter of one of the books, um, and then and meet to talk about, you know, what, what they got, what they learned from it. So very interesting, she's still doing this kind of work, like choose your sacred text and spend some time with it. Um, that was all the hub. We celebrated Darwin Day every year. Human hub, uh, human hub. I was I was a presenter presenter one year. I would invite scientists to come and talk a little bit about their work. That was fun. We'd have a cake and you know celebrate Mr. Darwin. <clears throat> all right, that was 2013 to 2018, which you'll recognize is exactly five years, which is exactly like the, the lease on that space in Harvard Square, and that matters. Um, because it doesn't, the humanist hub is, is no more. Um, the chaplaincy is alive and well, but not that, that, that church, that big thing that we were building for five years. So th here's the negatives. Here are the, th the reasons why, uh, or just what were the challenges and now lessons we had from that experience? And the first one is, uh, I hope you get the joke there, you know, uh, leading atheists like herding cats. Um, and this is actually an understatement. Um, some people, by virtue of being atheists, are just not followers. Uh, they're not joiners. Uh, they might they might come seeking community because I think that's a pretty human thing. But the idea that they would then respond to a call from the front saying, "Hey, it'd be really great if we had a few more donors so we can pay the rent here in our facility," for example. We some of us reached the conclusion that there was that, that you know so. <laughs> The failure was baked into the thing from the beginning. Um, and it's not just donations, that's a minor point actually, but just um, having a program, having people come and be a part of something that they'll then, you know, follow norms or rules is it's, it's not the easiest thing with any human, but maybe not especially with um, the kind of person who would come to an organization that is for atheists. Let me stop and say, um, the, the thing that we read every single Sunday meeting at the, at the Humanist Hub, what we're about, our, our quote was, we are a place for atheists, agnostics, and allies. And it was very clear that we were not the atheist hub, we were the humanist hub. We had a lot of positive things we wanted to talk about, we wanted to be together. And we were very open. Like nobody, you didn't have to confess atheism. That's actually possible. But you, it, it wasn't about that. The fact is we were atheists and Greg's an atheist and Vanessa's an atheist and I'm an atheist, but that's not what it was about. I hope that makes sense. But the point is, it was a, second point, normal challenges running and maintaining a healthy community. Those are, nobody thinks that's easy. And I would argue it's especially hard if your population are people who've already said no, or you know, F you, to one of the most prominent organizing principles in our Western society. So, you know, just never gonna be easy. Another thing, there was a disconnect between our community, the Humanist Hub, and the Harvard community. And, and some of that's just natural because the Humanist Hub was open to everyone. And not, it, you didn't have to go be a Harvard student or faculty or affiliate of any kind to come. But, what we would say, we'd be great if we had people who would agree to be members and pay $20 a month to help support the activities of the hub. Some of the feedback we got was people who said, and this is understandable, I'm not going to give money to support a chaplaincy to the students at a university with an endowment that's bigger than the six times the size of the annual budget for the state of Massachusetts. I mean, you know, that's the kind of argument we get. And what, what can you say? <laughs> that's that's true. Um, it's, it, it is not so easy to get people to want to donate to something that looks for all the world, like 
it's to support Harvard University. Like, really? Um, I hope you can already guess or already knew that in fact the hum humanist hub and the chaplaincy does literally gets not a dime from the university, but that's not the point. The reason people were hesitant, I think, was like Greg's a chaplain to a bunch of spoiled, privileged people who, you know, are with legacy admissions and all this stuff. And so that was that was probably a problem for us. Biggest problem that we need to dwell on, but if if some of us wanted to start a chaplaincy in Arizona, we would have to keep our eye on as we did rely on a single to a large extent on single major donor who when that person was not enthused anymore. That was that, that was the end of it. My my privilege was to lead the organization through that transition from trying to to replace the, those funds to downsizing to to match the funds we had to downsizing back to the original only chaplaincy. So that wasn't very fun, uh, but you know, I'm still here. So I guess it worked. Um, and then, you know, one lesson that, that I don't think any of us saw coming, but that the national prominence of the humanist hub, it was widely known in humanist circles all over the country or the YouTube channel. Hemant Mehta would always talk about how great it was and all the stuff we did. You know, that didn't result in, in, the, in, in financial support. And so the organization could not continue to be a, a big flourishing, functioning church-like organization in Harvard Square. And so it's now just a chaplaincy. Um, those were the negatives. Uh, that was pretty negative. But here, I guess, if you don't mind me saying, these are the positives. Um, uh, what I see here, I've got fruits. I've got windows open over my, or just open over my slides. I can't see what I wanted to say, which is fruits and just fruits, sorry. Uh, that's a little religious callback of fruits of, uh, you know, I don't know, spirit of atheism. So a lot of stuff exists because of the humanist hub. First of all, all, all of the talks um, and the lessons from the big questions lab and all the stuff is still out there. You can, I'm sure, actually, I bet you can't watch a video of Mikey Weinstein. I bet they wouldn't agree to have him recorded, but all the other ones you could go see. You could see me introducing Dan Dennett. You can watch the talk. So these are now you know, five, five or more years old, but all that stuff. Uh, one of the greatest legacies of the hub uh, was training and mentoring other chaplains. Um, I mentioned Vanessa. Um, uh, Chris Stedman, who wrote the book Faithiest, um, was, a, was a chaplain at undergrad at Harvard. Uh, the, ch the current chaplain, uh, I think he's still the current chaplain at Tufts University, so you know, a couple miles from, from Harvard. Uh, um, was a was a trainee, uh, I think, of of Greg. So that 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 was cool. Um, we established some programs that could be taken off the shelf and reused, like our recovering from religion small group. It was really basic, but we have an outline of what we did. There were new board members, including me, uh, who came to be a part of it, and now are still part of the chaplaincy. And of course, the relationships that don't that don't go away. So there's a lot of good from it. Um, I, really, I realize it's really good for me to talk about the hub because it's 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 um, it's contraction was pretty traumatic, actually, pretty hard for everyone. Um, yeah, so that's the story of the hub. We're back. We to, have, yes, go ahead, Jeannie. We have one question here. This question is coming from Judy. Um, and she asks, do many of the universities have a chaplain in their institutions that match the original founder's religion, or does the representation reflect current religions within the staff and or student body? That's a great question. I think I understand the question. Um, I was actually a part of a Christian institution years ago, which um, did have a chaplain. And that chaplain was specifically an ordained minister of the religion that ruled that place. So there wouldn't have been any other chaplain. They wouldn't even have allowed it. That place, Calvin, Calvin University, I don't, I, I don't know how typical it is, but I would guess very typical. I would assume uh, that any, any, for example, Christian, sorry, Catholic institution um, will, will have a chaplain. I'm sure of it, um, and and that that will be their title. They're not just some priest who comes and hangs out. They're, they'd be in the chaplain. 
and almost certainly a, a, they would be a Catholic chaplain. There wouldn't be um, a Presbyterian chaplain at that that college. I will confess, and I did uh, want to remind you that I'm not I'm not an expert. What about, for example, the University of Notre Dame? Well, that is a Catholic institution. Everyone knows it, but it's a pretty global, pretty pretty diverse place. So I'm great, you know, homework. Let's all go see, does the, does the University of Notre Dame have chaplains, let's say a Protestant chaplain? Um, I'm going to guess they do, but I don't actually know. In general, though, and this is something I'm going to get to in a second, um, chaplains that are affiliated with the institution, I'm going to guess can only exist at a private institution, period. So there are no chaplains at the University of Arizona who are affiliated in any way with the University of Arizona. There's lots of chaplains, and that, we'll talk about this in a second. They have an organization that they're all a part of, and I, I assume some accountability. But you know, those, those Harvard chaplains I talked to you about, that website that you visit is called chaplains.harvard.edu. They have offices inside the Smith Center, which is the large student center right in Harvard Square. Same thing at MIT. MIT's chaplains have offices on campus and they don't get paid by the universities because these universities are behave like obnoxious parasites there, I said it. Um, so they're not gonna pay a dime to Greg for all the work he does, but, but he's got an office and he is affiliated with the university. I'm gonna guess he's, he answers to us as a board. I think he answers to the university. If he pisses them off, he could be kicked out. Yeah. So. But that's that's gonna. I'm, again, I'm not a lawyer, but I think that's highly specific to private universities and could not possibly happen here at the University of Arizona or at Arizona State or at NAU or UCLA. Anyway, just here's a list. It's not very helpful of of the places I know that have some active um, chaplaincies. Ryan Bell, at USC, is a, is a leader. I think he, he's he's one of the national leaders in the, in the idea of uh, you know deconversion, life without religion, and he runs a chaplaincy at USC. And Mary Mary, who's one of our board members, actually in Tucson, um, she is saying that he has a great podcast called Life After God. So if, if you're into podcasts, definitely check that one out. Um, th this is surely an incomplete list. Um, you'll, you'll recognize, you know, Ivy's on here and there's Tufts. And I wrote San Diego there because actually the chaplaincy that I found that's mentioned at the American Human Association is just called San Diego. So I don't even know if it's affiliated with an institution. It's meant to, but it doesn't say we're at UCSD or University of San Diego or San Diego State. It doesn't say that. Um, Tufts does. Again, Tufts is a private institution. Stanford does, they have active chaplaincies. So um, again, I, I think that this thing was really peaking a few years ago and, and it has not gone extinct, thank heavens, but it's it might need some more juice to keep going. I don't think the idea is dead by a long shot, but it's not as big as it was in 2017. I can, I can say that with confidence. Um, so let, let's just end by asking this question. Um, well, the, 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 ne the next slide is the last one and it asks the question, but let's talk about, you know, university chaplaincies in Arizona. There are none as far as I know. Now, what I, me what I mean is humanist chaplaincies. There are scores of chaplains, university chaplains in Arizona. Um, the University of Arizona, my wife and I were married at the Newman Center by a chaplain um, in uh, it was right after electricity was invented. So it was 1984. It was so great because before that, everything was torches and candles and that was a, such a pain. So ha ha. Um, we, were, we were Catholics, we were good Catholics and we, um, and we were married you know, at, a, at a, I mean, a church. I don't know if you've ever been to the Newman Center, the one in at Arizona State similarly is a, is a facility. It's not just an office somewhere. Um, so I certainly don't mean to say there aren't chaplaincies in, in Arizona, there's scores of them, but there are no humanist chaplaincies that I know of. And if I, and I'm gonna guess that's because there aren't any. <laughs> um, yeah, and, but, but even if there were, um, 
it's such a different situation from Stanford or USC or Harvard. Um, and it has nothing to do with the quality of the university at all, of course. It has everything to do with what a private institution can do versus what, what and I hope we all agree, what a public university can and should not do, right? So there are no organized, there is nothing on the U of A's website about chaplaincies. There are rules that the Dean of Students needs to and has failed to um, follow up on to protect students from exploitative, from religious abuse. That you'll find that on the website. If you want to find anything about, hey, if you want to talk to someone, go here. No. Uh, there's a council. U of A has a council. I'm certain this is exactly the same at Arizona State and NAU, that there are councils where the chapel do something. I don't know if, they, if, they're, if they're a good organization, they'll refer people to each other, they'll support each other. The chaplaincy organization at Harvard is a, is a collegial organization. Um, they elected Greg as their president because they like him, um, even though a fourth of them are evangelicals, actually. So, all right. So, no, there's no humanist university chaplaincies in Arizona. Um, and so, what if we wanted to start one? <laughs> so, all right. So, uh, look, I was a part, I am a part, I'm on the still on the board at the, at the humanist chaplaincy at Harvard and MIT. Um, and I didn't start it. In fact, I told you how it was started and that it's supported by a small endowment. So what would it take if, if someone wanted to start a chaplaincy at, let's say my alma mater at the University of Arizona? Yeah, so money, because, of, because um, uh, uh, we're not, we're not re re a religion. And so we would actually be committed to compensating someone for their work, you know, unlike half the religions we know. So um, it would take money. And where would that come from? And, it, you know, I, I don't know. And come on, all of us, none of us has enough money to support all the things we want to support in this world. But what it would come from is a committed board. Um, I think that a committed board would be a place to start, not with a person like, oh, we found, let's, let's hire Susan, should be a great chaplain. Uh, it wouldn't start that way. It would start with a board that then figures out a way to raise money um, and, and, and something sustainable so that, that the person could have a say a contract for three years or whatever. I'm just shooting from the hip here, but not the sort of fly by night bullshitty stuff we might see from other organizations. I would argue strongly you'd want an anchor in the community. Um, and that's, I frankly, I think that when I think of Secular Arizona or Tucson Atheist, which I've done a little bit with here in Tucson, like a good solid, community of, of secular humanists and allies, some, there might be believers who still want to support this, right, um, in the community so that like, like, for example, a Catholic chaplaincy at the University of Arizona, it wouldn't be just some dude who shows up and says, hey, I'm Catholic, I can do this, but they're somehow connected to the larger institution, to the Catholic Church. Um, I think that's probably a really important thing. Um, uh, we don't really have that actually, even at the Harvard chaplaincy because the hub was the organization that supported it. But there are organizations in metropolitan Boston and, and Cambridge that can, that can sort of lend credence in a way that I don't see here in Tucson. And maybe it's because I'm missing it. Anyway, my final comment is just, but I suspect that the need is significant. Um, I suspect there are students at the, at the U of A, at Arizona State, at NAU, who, when you go to class and you learn about how the world actually works, deconversion happens and, and having some kind of support for kids uh, leaving religion or questioning religion, or maybe they showed up, by the way, maybe they're raised without it. Now they show up and they're like surrounded by evangelicals who are talking about bullshit. You know, um, the need is probably very significant um, at our at our institutions. All right, so my last slide is just me saying thank you very much for having me. It was really fun. I hope we all get to meet in other contexts. Uh, fun fact, I'll stop talking after I tell you this. The reason I learned about you and, and got invited to do this is I met Lindsay at the Tucson Festival of Books uh, in March. Um, and so uh, maybe I'll see some of you there someday. Um, and then I'll follow up with the, with folks here about contact information, how you could reach me if you ever want to. So thanks. Well, and I we have, I mean, we have some pretty active uh, first of all, 
I mean, no shade to Phoenix, but Tucson has some really strong activists there and really strong activist groups, especially uh, there's the Tucson Atheist, there's the Tucson Atheist um, Community Outreach Team, taco. the Taco Team that are yeah. great. Um, there is uh, an or Adam congregation group like or no, it's actually the Secular Jews for Justice or Jews for Secular Government or something like that. But there are several down there. Then, of course, there's Mary um, Ganapol, who's on our board in Tucson, and she has a space now. And she also is is in charge of the Arizona end of life or she's you know, she's very involved in the Arizona end of life options. So one of my questions actually was like, um, uh, you know, with regards to that, I feel like that would be just a great partnership, you know, for folks who are facing the end of their lives and want somebody, you know, who can maybe just kind of counsel them through, which is a, a very difficult time. So that might be a really good group for you to connect with if you haven't already. And then I had a couple of questions like, um, so I, I, I'm imagining that you probably, you know, you can do weddings, right? You can be an officiant or you can do funerals. So we actually have a page on our website for people who don't want religious ceremonies. Um, I actually, I'm internet ordained. You know, I went to the Internet Unity Life Church just so I could marry my best friend back in, oh gosh, what was it, 2016? And so I've conducted, I think, five. And through our website now, I've got two more coming up and I love it. I love, you know, uh, so far my my odds are pretty good out of five. Only one ended in divorce. So I feel like those are really good rates. And it's just so much fun to, you know, to to help somebody who, and it's interesting because the couples that I am working with right now, you know, they want to be um, respectful because one of the, one of them from each couple comes from an LDS family. And so they're going to be at the wedding. So the, you know, it's just, it's, it's fun and interesting to put together something that's meaningful and not offensive to parents. <laughs> right. Um, so that if you are, if you're interested at all, we could put your contact information uh, to conduct weddings in Tucson. Um, we'd be more than happy to do that if you want to follow up. And then my next question. Well, I'm not, I'm not qualified to do that. Um, oh, okay. I, yeah, I'm a, I'm a board member of a, of a, of a chaplaincy, but I'm not a chaplain. Um, oh, okay. So it takes, I mean, about, I would... it takes about two minutes to become internet ordained. So, and I think it costs about 12 bucks. So it, that was you know, almost 10 years ago, but it's not expensive. I have a little, car. you know, it. if you get the, if you get the deluxe pack though, you can get this thing for your car that goes on your um, rear view mirror and it says chaplain parking, you know, or like clergy. Oh. Yeah. So if I really want to, I could park anywhere I want to. I've never utilized it, but you never know. Um, That's great. <laughs> uh, another thing. Oh, thanks for sharing the efficient directory. And like I said, Please, if you're interested or if you know people who would be happy to do, especially in Tucson, because we have a few other people listed there, but I think most of us are in Phoenix um, and I'm happy to drive, get out of the heat. My next question, though, was, are, do you know of any prisons that have humanist chaplains? Do I know of them? No, but I'm certain they exist. I, I, I am certain they exist. That's a great question because uh, the standard three institutions that people always list are hospitals, the military, and and universities, but um, ch ch many chaplains serve prisons. Um, great question. I don't know. I hope though. So. I hope so. I really hope that 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 exists. I'm gonna guess that um, some chaplains do double duty, um, so they're you know they're serving a, um, a hospital um, or even a university, and then are asked every now and then, could you come and you know do a service or something like that? Yeah. Great question. There well, should be. And most, you know, most of the work we do is really about, it's a lot of lobbying and, and tracking the bills that are moving through the legislature and identifying those that are clearly overtly, um, Jeannie, please try to be a chaplain for an Arizona legislative session. We need a, oh, well, you know, maybe if we get those, the seat in the House and the seat in the Senate, we could actually, uh, you know, drop the invocations altogether. It would be my preference. Uh, and then again, whenever the atheists come up and give their invocations, there's some God bothering, you know, evangelical that needs to take the microphone and, and give their overtly Christian um, invocation, whatever. I'd rather uh, there are no chaplains, to be quite honest, but that's just me. Anyway, um, 
we do a lot of work where we're tracking legislation and bills and mostly blocking things. And then now we're monitoring school board races. Of course, we have speakers like you who come in. Um, but some of the work that we do is is specifically with folks who are incarcerated because you know, they reach out to us and say, hey, I, you know, I'm a Muslim and they'll, you know, I can't walk five feet without running into a Bible in this place. They're passing them out like candy, but I can't get a Quran, you know, or I can't get a prayer or whatever it is, you know, so we will stand up too for what I guess we could call maybe more minority religions or, or you know, marginalized religions. Yeah. So we'll stand up for those religious folks, indigenous folks, whatever, who are incarcerated. Um because they do, they usually don't have anything else but a stack of Bibles that are given out freely by a bunch of different like churches and stuff like sure. that. Sure. Oh, that's great, though. I mean, yeah. the um, Quran's not my book of choice, but that's great for people. <laughs> right, right. Um, I do, I do like that, Judy. I'll take that into consideration. Um, Mars says, Stephen, thanks for the strong language and for saying you hate religion. It is a good message to share because others can relate, you know. And it's it's for us, it's like we are we're really focused on First Amendment constitution. So we do actually have people who are religious that we yeah. I mean, we partner with the Arizona Faith Network, Unitarian yeah. Universalist churches are great. We often speak at their congregations. Um, but uh but yeah, and so but we got cheeky a little bit. We did like this whole 12 days of Christmas thing where we were kind of putting up some snarky memes and gifts and things about religion and we got feedback and people were like you know I'm actually religious and I take offense to this so we try to walk a fine line and and remember that we do have folks who are faithful who are religious and we're just here for them for the, we're not anti-religion we're pro-constitution that's what I always say well there's three things for me so like I, I do I hate I hate religion like I, and I'm a I'm a I'm a apostate I have loved ones who are still you know believers but there's, you know, there's three reasons to say it out loud. One is, is so that you're being honest, like, well, you know, okay. um, while, while respecting the person, like, I actually think that's not that hard to do. Like, if someone says they like NASCAR, I can say, I don't, I like you. I mean, you know, I hate macaroni and cheese. Don't take it personally. I just don't like macaroni and cheese. And so... But the main reason I bring it up is because I want people to know, no, I'm working on this. I don't, I'm never going to go back to believing that stuff. Never. I think it's toxic and I think the world would be better off without it. But um, carrying, carrying hate around, I'm the only one who loses from that. Exactly. Uh, you know, my hatred of Christianity doesn't, doesn't do jack. To reduce its influence, all it does is make it harder to be me. And I, I'm in a much better place than I was five years ago, but it was, yeah. So anyway, mostly I was just kind of talking to my friends, like, oh, I'm just working on this. So yeah, like, yeah, I, I, it's, it's a lot to hang on to, you know, that kind of anger. So I just try to turn it into, you know, like I, I went to, I've gone to two school board meetings this week and I, and after what the one last night, I came home and watched the other one on YouTube. And, you know, for me, I try to just turn it into activism, activism, right? The the anger that I have over how these folks talk about, you know, their most marginalized students in the most disparaging ways. It's so disgusting. Yeah. But what can I do to combat it? I can show up. I can support the good board candidates. I can write about it for our Substack, yeah. And, you know, I can rally around the next group of candidates that that's coming in in 2024. You know, like, I feel like I get really frustrated sometimes with some of my closest friends who definitely are not like as politically aware and active, at least in po local politics as I am, you know, they'll sit and get angry about things. And I'm like, well, I have an opportunity for you to go canvas for a great school board candidate. Like, oh God, no, it's 112 degrees, you know, like, okay, then stop complaining. Um, there's a, there's a few more comments. I want to honor everybody's time because it's already 101. Um, let's see. Uh, Mary Ganapol uh, points out, I am dying out loud.org is advocating for secular chaplains in hospitals. Dave Warnock's new group, if you're not familiar with Dave Warnock, he is amazing. We got to see him um, this spring for the Arizona, or for the American Atheist Conference, uh, downtown Phoenix, so good. One of the best speakers, it was amazing. And they raised quite a bit of money for his organization. Definitely recommend. Um, Mars says, all these people dying in hospice care don't get any options for community and connection unless they want a religious version. They just get nothing. Absolutely. 
like and and it really frustrated me last legislative session when they made an exception for clergy to come in to hospitals and not have to wear masks if there was a mask mandate like you know because it's their religious privilege or whatever but there's no there's no um oh what's the word i'm looking for there's no option for a non-religious clergy i mean i guess maybe i could since i am internet ordained technically i could you know use that parking lot you know hanger that maybe i'll do that but it is very frustrating Kay says, we really tried to keep Free Thought Arizona going. It was an issue of everyone wanting to have it, but no one stepping up to be that committed board. Hmm, I totally understand that. I felt that I lacked the know-how to run a nonprofit organization. Any ideas would go a long way. Also note that the median age of our organization was about 75. Gosh, that is always such an issue, Kay. So we really need some younger people. And that's the tricky part, like trying to figure out how do we bring the younger people in who we know with every generation, more and more of them are nuns, meaning they don't adhere to any kind of religious ideology and tapping into that. As a mother of two 20 something year old children, I, I think I know what they go through on a daily basis, whether, you know, my daughter who did go to college and managed to get a degree and a lot of scholarships to cover it, she still has some student loans. My son who didn't go to college and essentially lives from paycheck to paycheck. Um, I feel like these kids, while they do agree with us, we need to meet them where they're at and figure out what it is that would get them to those spaces, you know, more, you, you know, is it, is it drag bingo, maybe it's drag bingo, and then in between we could talk about, you know, what's happening with regards to the separation of church and state I know a lot of <laughs> drag queens who could entertain um, and and really be able to talk about that kind of stuff and bring awareness. I don't know what it is. I don't know what the answer is. Is it more happy hours? If you have the answers, please let us know. Um, Mary says, sometimes people pray over those dying in a hospital without even asking, which I would be so angry about. I, I And that'll be part of my, you know, whenever I end up leaving this planet, I will make sure that nobody is going to be praying over me. My children know me well enough to know that that is not going to happen. Mars says, uh, yep, just working in hospice care seems to be an open invitation for Jesus, but no other gods around. And then Mars also says, we appreciate secularists that are religious. Thank you for supporting separation of church and state. Absolutely. As a matter of fact, um, Stephanie Stahl Hamilton, I, I wonder if you know her, Stephen. She's actually, she used to be in the Senate. Now she's in the House of Representatives here in Arizona, but she represents a good chunk of Tucson. And she's actually an ordained Presbyterian minister, but she scores 100% on our secular scorecard every oh, cool. session. She's awesome. Yeah. Wait, is she the one who hid the Bibles under the... <laughs> she went, went to jail for putting bibles in there and they're like oh you made a sit on our sacred text oh god like are you you're serious aren't you I mean, oh my shouldn't, god. shouldn't your sacred text be like shouldn't it have like some imaginary protection around it you know, like, slightly more robust than that that's what i, I would have thought but you know it's so silly no we have oh, I mean, about that one and you know they actually wanted to try to pull with her uh, the same thing that is happening with Southwest Airlines, where they're bringing in, um, what is it, the Alliance Defending Freedom to educate them on religious uh, expression. And these employees are really pissed off about it. But they tried to get that to happen to Stephanie Stahl Hamilton. And, and she was like, absolutely not. <laughs> so anyway, this has been a really great conversation. You opened my eyes uh, to something that I didn't even, I, I had no idea until Lindsay had this scheduled. I was like, wait, what? A, a humanist chaplain? That's great. So I, it's been great meeting you. Usually our Fridays are a bit of a downer. Um, but this has been a great day. So I appreciate you, Stephen. And um, is there anything you want to close us out with? No, except you can contact me anytime. I mean, again, I'm not an expert, but I mean, I'm a, I'm certainly an ally and I'm looking for, you know, building the communities here in Tucson that that Susan and I can be a part of and um, uh, we're working can, on that. So invite me to people, anything you want to. How can people get in touch with you? Can I put it in the chat? Yeah. Uh, I think the simplest thing is my uh, personal email. So it's Stephen at sfmatheson.com. Hold on, I got the chat. I can okay, good. Myself. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I don't want to screw it up. And once you get there, you'll you'll be good. Um, there you go. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. All right. Well, 
Thanks so much to everybody for joining us. Thank you, especially to Stephen. I am headed out to celebrate a friend's birthday in Heber, Arizona, and I've heard it's like 75 there. So I'm pretty excited about getting out of the heat and seeing friends. And thank you again, Stephen, for joining us today. I appreciate it. My pleasure. It. Thanks for having all right. me. See all right. you all. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.